also here to answer questions. And then we will, after that presentation, we'll leave some time for questions. And then we will hear from representatives from all six of our casinos. And then um, there'll be a chance for um, questions to all of them after that. So again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and for your time. And I'll hand it over now to uh, Mr. Medenica. Uh, hello and, and welcome to another one of these uh, new normal virtual meetings uh, uh, that we're all getting used to. Um, uh, we do have a, a, a short deck here. Uh, Sarah, will you be uh, putting those slides up? And if you could, please, we'll start with that. Yes, I will share the screen now. Okay. Okay. Can you go back to the uh, first page? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, uh, go ahead and get started. That's just the cover page. If you would uh, take it to the next page. Thank you. Um, as I think is uh, obvious to uh, everybody on the uh, uh, call and the meeting today, uh, this pandemic has just been a huge uh, change in the way we do everything in our lives, uh, much less uh, manage our business as well. Uh, when, when things started getting really bad in, in March, uh, one of the uh, first things we did in anticipation of the uh, uh, severe reduction in, in uh, the state itself is a uh, what I would call a massive re-engineering of the workforce itself. And that uh, required us going through almost employee by employee and deciding who was essential, uh, who could telework, uh, who needed to stay home but was not capable of teleworking, who absolutely had to be uh, in the office because of the uh, physical nature of their work. And so we went through this period of time, uh, we uh, assigned uh, laptops and equipment to uh, dozens of employees uh, so that they could telework. And we very rapidly uh, managed to get uh, just about everyone, uh, certainly out of the office building, but then also to reimagine how, uh, for example, our lottery sales force in, in visiting uh, retailers uh, would go about their work in the future. So this was a, uh, a rather intense period of time and uh, we were really learning as we went along and modifying and changing and improving uh, as we did things. Uh, so with the, uh, uh, some of the initial uh, lockdowns uh, that uh, were initiated by the state, uh, one of the things that obviously we saw very early on was the, uh, the closure of bars and restaurants. And bars and restaurants is a category of our retailers uh, represented about 15% of our base. So we immediately saw, you know, the shutdown of those retailers impacting lottery sales. Uh, at the same time, of course, no one knew just how bad and, and how deep this would get. Uh, and uh, we decided to, uh, and, and mainly because of the logistics of uh, how we distribute games and especially instant tickets, uh, we decided to cancel our April launch of new instant tickets. Now we are on a uh, normally a monthly launch schedule for instant tickets. We launch anywhere from three, four, five uh, new instant tickets every month. Uh, and uh, those are distributed by vendors and UPS and, and that sort of thing and, and are received by retailers. Um, rather than uh, overwhelm retailers with uh, inventory that frankly we weren't sure would be selling, uh, we decided just to cancel that April launch. At the same time, uh, we had just launched a whole new category of game called Fast Play uh, back in February, and uh, they were a huge success. Uh, in fact, of all the states around the country that have launched this type of game, uh, I think our launch was uh, spectacularly uh, number one, something like double the number two in terms of uh, uh, consumer response and, and people buying the tickets. So we were all set for a uh, second wave of those fast play tickets. We also canceled that or didn't cancel, de delayed that uh, until we had a, a better sense of what was going on. And then unilaterally really, uh, we just canceled all paid advertising. And I have to say that was, uh, uh, somewhat a, a subjective and somewhat of a personal decision, but uh, 
if you can remember back to March, and perhaps you were watching TV because that was uh, pretty much all we could do, uh, there were still a lot of advertisers uh, on TV. And to us, the messages that, uh, since they were obviously pre-COVID messages, to me just sounded very tone deaf. And I did not want us in the lottery to be in that same category of appearing tone deaf in light of the much more significant things that were going on in the country and in the world. And uh, so we just decided to, uh, to, to step back. Um, then we saw what I can only describe as a, a very strange phenomenon. If you could turn to the next page. Oh, let me uh, just one second, uh, add one other thing on these early steps. We also closed our, our customer resource center. That is where the, uh, the office where winners can come in to cash their tickets. And again, because we didn't know what all the protocols might be going forward, we just decided to close. Now, of course, winners can cash up to $600 at uh, lottery retailers. So a lot of the, uh, the smaller wins uh, were still able to be cashed. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have a group of uh, uh, roughly 400 retailers that can cash up to $5,000. So a lot of the winning tickets could still be cashed. Uh, however, all our casinos, for example, are, re are customer service centers and can cash up to 25,000. And of course, they were closed, so we, we lost that capability. At the same time, though, we made it clear and we announced and communicated that we would extend uh, the expiration dates of all tickets for 30 days beyond whenever the state of emergency ended. So uh, no one will lose out eventually. And also, we upped our ability to uh, uh, take in tickets by mail. We can cash by mail. Uh, we encourage people to get subscriptions, things like that. So there was a a number of efforts there to stay in touch with our players, but also to give them options uh, that would keep them safe. So uh, if you would then go to the next page. And this is what we were seeing early on in this pandemic. The, uh, the ceiling absolutely fell away. And, in, and these are weekly uh, sales results for the lottery. And as you can see there, by mid-March, we were starting to come down. And those percentages are... Uh, uh, up or down from year over year. So the same performance the year before, which by the way, if you recall, was an all time record year for the lottery. Uh, we were doing well, uh, as you can see, we we're still up uh, even that first week in March. And then we just started seeing the, uh, uh, the bottom fall out. Uh, sales were going down 20%, 25%, 30%. And we really didn't know where, where the bottom would be. Uh, obviously we lost some of our uh, retail base, but uh, also people weren't going out, they weren't driving, they weren't visiting the gas stations. And so we really didn't know what to make of it. Uh, and uh, so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we were, we still, we had a commission meeting uh, in April. And at that time in, in trying to get a sense and trying to, uh, uh, put a number on how this decline would go. And again, we didn't know how far down this might continue. We thought the lottery could be as much as $50 million off of uh, the, uh, the BRE estimates of what we were supposed to produce uh, for fiscal 20 anyway. Um, uh, however, then things started turning around. And as you can see here in this pattern, strange as it was, uh, started picking up. And certainly by May, we were doing extremely well. And by June, we're up 20% plus week over week. It, it's really a remarkable recovery. Um, so if you would uh, go to the next slide. Um, again, uh, some of these things I just mentioned already that uh, before the crisis, we were only down $3 million from year over year. And again, that record year included that one and a half billion dollar Mega Millions jackpot that everyone remembers with great fondness at this point. Uh, but uh, we were uh, on, on track to even top that year. Uh, but then, uh, of course, things just fell away. Um, now we think uh, we'll only be down something like 10 million uh, compared to fiscal 19. And uh, given that the uh, BRE forecast for the lottery back in December, and again, that's pre-COVID, uh, had us uh, presume that we would be down anyway because uh, fiscal year 19 was so spectacular. 
uh, we will in fact be well above, maybe 12 million, maybe more above the BRE, the pre-COVID BRE numbers from back in uh, December. So, uh, and the question we're getting, and we're getting it from the press, we're getting it from uh, lots of uh, stakeholders, is why now are we doing so well? And there was some, uh, some naysayers who were out there who speculated that the lottery was doing well because of the stimulus checks coming out of the uh, federal government. And uh, we, we knew for a fact that that was not the case. Uh, we were talking to our colleagues in Canada and Canada, Canadian lotteries were seeing the exact same pattern. By the way, the pattern that we saw here in Maryland, very typical around the country. So we're, we're really not unique in that this is, this is a broader phenomena than uh, just our state. But nevertheless, uh, the Canadian experience was that they were seeing the exact same phenomena with uh, a, an early significant dip followed by a, a very substantial uptick. And uh, so our, our theory at this point is that there really is just no place else for people to spend some discretionary entertainment dollars. There are no movies, there are no sports, there are no concerts, there are no bars and restaurants. Uh, and so uh, we think that has translated into people who, uh, you know, locked at home, uh, have decided, especially on uh, instant scratch off tickets, uh, when they're in the grocery store to pick up a few. And uh, it has uh, obviously been to our benefit. Um, uh, next slide, please. However, during a lot of that period of time, uh, we were really focused on the casinos. And obviously, uh, you know, they were shut down completely as of uh, March 16th. But uh, a little uh, anecdote, before March 16th, uh, we, in cooperation with uh, all of our casinos, were starting to work on uh, activities that we could voluntarily limit uh, to begin to take activity regardless of uh, what uh, directives were going to be coming down from the state. Uh, however, the, uh, the events kind of overtook that initial work and uh, obviously the uh, casinos were ordered to uh, be closed on March 16th. However, uh, based on you know, the little bit of work that we had already started at that point, uh, we continued working on reopening plans. Now at that point, no one had any idea when we would be able to reopen, what the conditions would be. So we started uh, paying a huge amount of attention to everything coming out of uh, all of the uh, health uh, authorities and the professionals uh, about uh, the kinds of things that we needed to uh, pay attention to. And I've, I've got to uh, you know, say with, with, uh, with great thanks, uh, all of the casinos were tremendously cooperative and great partners in this whole effort. We were putting together uh, some top line uh, guidelines for the casinos. Uh, the casinos went way deeper than that and developed individual plans uh, that were dozens of pages long that dealt with, uh, you know, really the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, the, the, the products used in cleanliness and everything else. And uh, at the same time, uh, I also participate with uh, industry groups of casino regulators. And so we were talking uh, with our peers uh, in casino states all over the country, uh, from Las Vegas and New Jersey and, and everything in between about the things that people were paying attention to. And a lot of the, uh, the top line guidelines uh, centered around you know, some of these, these uh, major category, clearly capacity limits uh, were going to come into effect. The, the protocols for cleaning uh, were in, incredibly detailed. Uh, social distancing obviously has become something that everybody is hugely aware of. Uh, the wearing of masks as well was a, a subject that we talked about. Uh, we had huge discussions about how to use plexiglass and, and to create uh, barriers between people, how to perhaps take every other slot machine out of a bank of machines so that nobody would be sitting next to somebody. Um, uh, also, there was a discussion about reduced hours. Uh, in the case of some of our casinos, uh, they, uh, they, wa they wanted to close overnight to do a thorough overnight cleaning with no patrons there. And we were uh, obviously very uh, amenable to that. Uh, others uh, talked about uh, closing areas of the, of the gaming floor for certain times during the day to do extra cleaning. All of this, all of this was uh, with the focus on staff and patron safety. Uh, and we knew that uh, uh, it would be uh, very bad for the industry, very bad for, for us 
uh, if we had some of those scenes that uh, we've seen uh, from some of the early openings of other kinds of uh, venues uh, around the country. Uh, nevertheless, then, uh, you know, things began improving uh, in Maryland and, and certainly in the Northeast. And uh, we were given the green light to uh, begin reopening in uh, late June. Uh, I believe four of our casinos opened on the 19th and two opened on the 26th. Some uh, had a sort of a phased in opening uh, with uh, using their, their player club, their loyalty club uh, for invitations to, to bring people in. And again, during that whole period of time, the casinos uh, went out of their way to, uh, again, uh, reconfigure their floors, uh, add capabilities, uh, put in plexiglass, use all of the techniques that we had been studying intensely for the, uh, the last uh, period of time. Uh, if you would uh, go to the next slide. Unfortunately, this is not a pretty picture. Uh, as you saw, uh, obviously our casino business has been very successful uh, for uh, several years now. And normally uh, on a rough average, uh, the, the contributions, this is the money that comes to the designated good causes uh, as uh, decided by the state was roughly in the 60 million range uh, the, uh, after the initial growth and uh, certainly after the uh, opening of uh, MGM a couple of years ago, uh, the, the growth rate had leveled off to sort of the single digit, but it certainly was consistent, uh, very profitable, very successful. And then of course you see in March with uh, half the month eliminated, went away completely, nothing in April and May. And of course we have a little bit of a stub period in June that really isn't indicative of much. Now, we, uh, we always put out our casino numbers on the fifth of the month. So I think we'll all be anxious to see what a, uh, the first full month of July will look like for the casinos when those numbers come out late next week. Um, and then if you would uh, turn to the last slide, please. Um, this is what, you know, obviously what everyone is concerned about now is what does the future hold? And uh, to be uh, probably, uh, Brutally frank, I, I think uh, we have to accept a, uh, a long-term lowering of our expected casino contributions. Now, uh, you know, to the extent that there's a silver lining there, I think even though we're running at 50% capacity limits, we do think that revenue uh, will not go down by 50%, but we really don't have a good handle on that. Um, you know, if we're lucky, maybe we'll get 60, 70, 80% of the revenues, uh, but that's somewhat in the unknown and I would be reluctant to try to make any forecast uh, at this point, but I, I am optimistic that it'll be at least 50% and, and probably more than that. Um, on the lottery side, uh, again, uh, we have, we've come back with advertising. Um, what's interesting is, uh, first of all, we went through a, uh, a transition period and again to, to the phrase that I used early on, we, we definitely didn't want to be tone deaf. And so a lot of our uh, initial advertising dealt with, uh, you know, staying safe. Uh, we have a tag that we've now been putting on all the advertising, play safe. Uh, and we want to uh, know that, you know, we're, we're with people and we understand the challenges that, uh, that everyone is up against. Also, uh, we've had to change the media mix, uh, obviously, uh, you know, you think about the balance between television and radio and outdoor and digital. Uh, outdoor is probably a little soft because people aren't driving as much. Um, television and radio is very strong, uh, again, because people are home. Uh, digital, very strong. So uh, in terms of where we're placing some of the ads, uh, I think you'll see some subtle shifts uh, in that media mix uh, in response to where people are absorbing media uh, these days. Uh, we also then uh, came back with that uh, second uh, group of uh, fast play uh, games uh, and that's continued uh, its success. And so overall, I, I, I would summarize the, the strength that we've seen on the lottery as being in the daily numbers, which have, we've set some all time records on uh, things like pick four, instant tickets uh, have been doing extremely well, racetracks, our monitor game uh, has actually been doing quite well. Kino, uh, the other monitor game uh, is a little soft. Where we're weak though, and this is again, not unique to Maryland, are the national jackpot games, Mega Millions and Powerball. And uh, last year, those games were probably off 40 to 50% from where they were uh, from that all time record year of a year before. And this is something that's taking a tremendous amount of focus nationally with all the industry groups. 
uh, working on uh, what we can do uh, to uh, once again enhance our, our national jackpot games. Um, you know, we used to talk about jackpot fatigue, and I think now maybe the phrase might become jackpot exhaustion. And we may have gone to the golden goose on, on the jackpot games uh, uh, over the recent past. So that's where we've been a little weak. But again, those games represent less than 10% of our revenues. So we have a, a strong mix of other games and the portfolio is rich enough to, uh, to back that up and, and to produce what would have been a, a, another record year anyway. Um, and then potential growth areas, uh, new lines of business, obviously uh, on the casino side, I don't think we need to uh, uh, go into great depth on sports betting. I think we all know where that is. We're looking forward to the referendum in November and that passage uh, and uh, legislation coming up in the next session. Uh, we're already working on uh, you know, being prepared for what passes and, and the guidance coming uh, from the legislature. And then on the lottery, uh, just a, a quick note on iLottery. Uh, as, as you know, uh, several states in the US now sell lottery tickets over the internet. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in Maryland, it's specifically uh, banned uh, in statute that was uh, passed a few years ago. And certainly one of the phenomena that we've seen during the, uh, the, the shutdowns in the recent months is that those states who offer iLottery have seen their iLottery sales absolutely uh, uh, explode. And uh, so that's a, uh, an avenue that I think uh, to the extent that, you know, this kind of new normal that we're living with uh, uh, needs to be dealt with. I think iLottery may be something that uh, we'll wanna consider uh, in the future. And certainly we're, we're now surrounded, uh, Virginia and Pennsylvania both have strong iLottery programs. And uh, so I think it's uh, one of those things that's inevitable for the future. And uh, one of the, the best aspects of that is from all the experience that everyone's had with iLottery, it doesn't hurt bricks and mortar sales. And that's very important to us because our retailers will continue to be our most important source of uh, sales for us in, into the future. But it might be a nice uh, adjunct. Um, and uh, we, we got a couple of uh, questions about, uh, uh, you know, what our advertising will look going forward. I think I addressed that somewhat. And also to the extent that uh, we are paying uh, very strong attention uh, to our colleagues in the industry. And I think that's always been true with the lottery business. We, we, for the most part, don't really compete with one another. And so what we have is a very collegial, cooperative and everybody in the lottery business is talking to everybody right now. And everything that everyone is doing uh, is, uh, is getting discussed and shared. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll all learn from one another and uh, share in our success going forward. So uh, with that, I would uh, welcome any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Medenica. And thank you for answering one of my questions already. Uh, to members, um, no one has texted me this time. Sometimes people text me or they, uh, or they put it in the chat box or they do the raised hand feature. So whatever uh, works for you. Uh, but in the meantime, let me ask a question um, uh, to Mr. Medenica. Um, in terms of uh, and something that you didn't talk about, in terms of something like the problem gambling fund and the money that it gets uh, from, from the casinos, um, are there shortages right now? Are there people that we're not serving or are we still in a good place there? You know, our funding level has been very strong. I think we're one of the strongest states in the union in terms of funding level. Uh, in terms of the, the need and the outreach, um, I, I would defer to uh, our folks at, uh, at mental health uh, to, to answer that. Uh, I think there will be a, uh, a slight shortfall in the funding mechanism this year because of the shutdown. Uh, obviously, the funding mechanism is a you know direct. Uh, uh, it's linear with uh, casino uh, uh, slot counts, and those are down. So I think uh, in the future uh, we we may be at a lower level than we have been in the past. But uh, again, my sense is that uh, programs were uh, fully funded. I think there maybe were some research activities uh, that got delayed, and uh, whether that's uh, a funding related delay or others, I would defer to to them to answer that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have questions from uh, Delegate Lutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Medenica, thanks for the presentation. I wonder um, what the experience is in terms of, you mentioned iLottery, but uh, some of our neighboring states also have legalized uh, online table games um, from their casinos. 
Um, have they similarly seen significant revenue increases through that avenue? Uh, you know, your question raises a very good point, uh, and that is the, the sort of, we're not sure what the difference is between iLottery and iGaming. And uh, what, what I, the way I would characterize it is it's really the payout level of the games themselves. And there's a controversy in Pennsylvania right now, I'm not sure if you're following it, where uh, the lottery and the casinos are two separate state groups. So they're, they're not together like uh, we are here in Maryland. And the lottery launched the uh, uh, iLottery, but they have uh, a product called eInstance, which is basically the instant tickets uh, at payout levels that are closer to casino payout levels. So the, uh, the controversy and the casinos in Pennsylvania are complaining is that the lottery is putting out uh, a product that looks like an, an e-gaming or an i-gaming product, uh, calling it i-lottery. And, and pretty much the experience from lotteries, this is uh, the successful ones like Michigan and Pennsylvania, is that the higher the payout of the game, the more revenue it generates. So uh, selling things like Powerball and Mega Millions that have a 50% payout doesn't really move the needle. And those lotteries like Georgia and Kentucky and some others uh, that basically sell the same products, they just sell them online, are seeing probably less than 1% of their revenue coming from online. Whereas those states that are selling the high payout products that again, may controversially be considered iGaming, not iLottery, they're doing extremely well. So I think the, the revenue potential is in the high payout games. Uh, but of course, there, there is that sweet spot about you know, having a payout that uh, is high enough to encourage play, but not so high that the, uh, the operating margins are you know, uh, minuscule, a single digit. Sorry for the complexity of the answer. <laughs> Uh, it looks like he's satisfied with the answer. Uh, our next question was put on the screen by Delegate Patterson, but um, if she can be unmuted so she could ask the question. Nope, Delegate Patterson, you remuted yourself after unmuting. Good. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My question centers around um, those uh, employees. And, and so um, my question is, has the industry assist with uh, um, any kind of initiative or program to assist employees during uh, these extreme times? For example, uh, assistance with uh, rent or electric bills or any kind of extra need uh, that they may have associated with the, the, the pandemic closings? Um, I think that uh, was, uh, there was great concern that that would become a problem. Uh, as you know, all the casinos, when they shut down, uh, kept everyone on the payroll for a limited period of time, but eventually, mm -hmm given that they didn't know when they would reopen, people started being furloughed. And uh, I, I have to say the casinos have done a great job because even folks that were furloughed, uh, they allowed their medical benefits to continue. And I believe everyone's medical benefits continued uh, for a period of time that we, we uh, haven't even hit yet. So the casinos have now reopened. One of the other concerns was that uh, whether or not the employees would come back. And uh, the casinos, and I'm sure you've seen this in the national debate, was whether or not the federal unemployment subsidy actually created a disincentive for people coming back to work. And so this was in, in those many discussions that we had with the casinos during that period of time. It was something that we're concerned about. I remember uh, on a, uh, another call with some industry colleagues, uh, it was an issue in, in some of the casinos that opened very early uh, uh, back in, in May. Uh, however, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to report, and I'll let the uh, casino uh, general managers who come after me uh, maybe speak more specifically to this, but I think for the most part, the overwhelming number of employees all came back. And I think uh, it's not just about uh, you know, the, the unemployment insurance, but I think it's also about having benefits uh, and uh, having a, a, a career and being able to uh, you know, deal with uh, uh, the uncertainties that we have going mm -hmm. forward. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that people had some, some personal dislocations during that period of time, 
Uh, I hope it was minimized. Uh, and again, I think everybody now is coming back. And uh, that's, and again, keep in mind that when the casino program was launched in Maryland, it really had two objectives. One, obviously, was to make money for the state and for education. But secondly, was it for employees? And mm -hmm. the casinos collectively employed uh, 10, 12,000 people. So it's, it's a very important aspect of the reopening of the casinos to bring back those employees and, and for that benefit that it gives to them, their families, and for the state. Thank you. All right, thank you, Delegate Patterson. Uh, next question we have is from uh, Delegate Ebersole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I feel like two things got a little conflated there in your answer to Delegate Lukey's question. I just want to separate them and, and ask a piece of information. I lottery, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is more about buying lottery tickets and participating in lottery games uh, through on your phone or through an electronic device. I casino or I gaming would be more like having roulette wheels and uh, craps games available online also. Is that correct, first of all? Do I have them uh, separate? Roughly, except that the, uh, the demarcation is not a very good, it's not a hard line. And okay. uh, when you think of, and, and probably the best example is a slot machine. Now you think about when you're playing a slot machine in a casino, you're basically just sitting in front of a screen uh, okay. with electronic images and given that you know, slot uh, revenue is the bulk of casino revenue. Uh, so games that replicate slots are very easy to imagine, but they're also games that replicate uh, table games. Now, also the casinos though, uh, can uh, through virtual means like this, uh, actually broadcast with a live dealer. And uh, that's something that they're doing as well. That uh, I don't think you'll see uh, anyone on the lottery side trying to replicate, but certainly in terms of what, what are called uh, electronic instant tickets uh, can be made to look like a slot machine. And that's part of the dispute. In and you accurately point out that a lot of, and especially now we go, if we go electronic, we're looking at revenue less than we are jobs in this particular case. You, you cite several other states as being involved. Do we have any data about the increases in revenue that occur when they go to iLottery or iGaming? And I know I'm putting on the spot, so maybe this is an offline conversation, but I think before we jump into it, we need to know, actually in this case, how much money will we get? What will yeah. and, what and will increase revenue? Again, uh, with the, uh, the states that had high payouts, and Michigan is probably the pioneer there, uh, they've been seeing uh, their iLottery business uh, grow double digits. Now, I think uh, we need to be careful about using the numbers that are coming out of the pandemic right now, where we're seeing 30, 40, 50% increases in I lottery, granted from a small base, but nevertheless, huge increases. But I think there is uh, significant revenue potential in those high payout games. But then other states that haven't gone quite in that direction are not seeing huge uh, spikes other than during snowstorms and times when people can't get out and, and buy their tickets. And I'll, that's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly, thank you, Delegate Ebersole. Uh, next question, Delegate Mosby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I, I have a uh, headset. Um, two quick questions. One, on the line graph uh, that uh, you presented er earlier, the year-to-date comparison, did I read it correct that where we are today from a lottery perspective is 20% uh, net positive than where we were at the same exact time last year? That's correct, yes. So what... And I guess because folks, it was such a huge downturn during the, the height of the quarantine uh, that people literally rushed out the house, bought things, but also bought lottery tickets and things of that nature. Is that what we, is that, is that, is that the, the pattern of behavior that we are? Well, uh, again, the first month they did, uh, but then it, it recovered. And certainly by May and June, we started seeing those very positive results. Gotcha. And I, and I assume the expectation is either it's going to level off to where we were uh, or maybe continue to grow uh, if uh, things stay the same? I, I, I think that'll be a function of, again, all those other activities that uh, people once enjoy. Uh, so if uh, concerts, sports, movies, uh, bars and restaurants, to the extent that they come back, I think they will you know, reclaim some of that spending. So I would expect uh, you know, those 20% increases not to last and again, I don't think any of us can predict how long this uh, new normal will last, but I think yeah. uh, we will continue to do well 
to the extent that all of these other activities continue to be very constrained. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting comparison. Um, my second question uh, is pertaining to the disparity uh, report associated with the sports wagering um, implementation. Has, um, do we know if it's still on track to, I think it was expected to complete at the end of October. Like, has there been a check-in with the consultant and the AG's office, or do you have any updates about it? Yes, we are uh, uh, act, uh, working very hard to meet that October 1st deadline. Uh, we've been working with MDOT, which is obviously the lead agency on these sorts of things. Um, and uh, we are uh, you know, working hard and expect to uh, have that report uh, in that time frame. All right, thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Elgin Mosby. Uh, I don't see any other questions from members. So maybe if anyone was holding back because they uh, thought there was a long line, is uh, anyone else looking to ask a question? Put your um, virtual hand up or your real hand up, anybody? All right, uh, seeing none, um, I will thank Mr. Medenica and his team. And if they can stay on in case there are more questions at the end, uh, we'd appreciate it. Uh, we next, if everyone should have gotten an agenda and we're gonna hear from representatives from the different casinos. Uh, in the order from, as listed from Hollywood, Casino Perryville to Ocean Downs, to Live Casino and Hotel, Rocky Gap, Horseshoe, and then MGM National Harbor. Uh, we offered everyone uh, five minutes, so I am gonna be looking at the clock because uh, I know there'll be a lot of repetition between you all, so we don't want uh, anyone to uh, go too long. Uh, so we'll start with Hollywood, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Matt High School, I'm general manager at Hollywood Casino in Perryville. Um, we also submitted some written testimony outlining what I am uh, about to discuss too. So thrilled to be able to come before you today to give you a sense for what life is like in this new weird world for all of us in the casino business. Um, you know, Hollywood is one of the largest employers and economic engines in Cecil County, usually about 275 employees, 40% uh, of whom are uh, from the county itself. Uh, we were thankful last year to have many of you up to show off the casino and the county, um, but a visit now would um, be a completely different experience than you saw when you were up last October. Um, the director set the stage well and provided some sense of really the extreme changes that have come as a part of being able to reopen thermal cameras that scan individuals with entry, uh, reduce machine counts with every other one um, shut off or disabled um, to try to promote some, uh, some social distancing with regards to gaming plexiglass barriers to provide shielding where that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, overall enhancement of cleaning protocols, including augmenting existing staff with overnight cleaning teams or outside contractors to come in and disinfect and requiring masks is just some of the stuff you'd notice you know, immediately upon entry at this point. We're really thankful to the lottery and to the other casinos for having uh, really just a tremendous spirit of camaraderie as we went through the process of beginning to get ready to reopen to try to make sure that we were doing it in a similar way. Um, after we got approval from the lottery and the Cecil County Health Department for our reopening protocols, uh, we were thrilled to be able to open up at the exact moment we could. So 5 p.m. on Friday, June 19th, it was an emotional day for me personally, uh, as well as our, all of our employees trying to get you know, everybody back after having been furloughed for, for many months. We had a, a line outside when we started. We, we opened up to the general public, unlike some of the other casinos. So we socially distanced the line outside and knocked it down about a half hour, and it was it was very busy, um, but, uh, but manageable. And really, then it became a matter of employees and customers working on getting used to all the operational changes. The months before that were devastating, of course, for business. So during the shutdown, Hollywood lost over 20 million in gaming revenue. We usually do about 75 million in gaming revenue on an annual basis. So that's 27% of our annual income. And it was a little bit more, <laughs> more difficult to stomach because January and February were some of the strongest numbers we had seen in years. Um, Hollywood was up double digit percentages in both months, which really suggested that the Northern Maryland gaming market was quite healthy at the time. We're up to 479 available VLTs, which is about 60% of our typical count of just under 800. We have 10 of our 13 table games open, um, which we were able to accomplish by having a new pit created where poker used to be. Uh, both of our Green Turtle restaurant offerings are available. Uh, so is our off-track betting, which is our partnership with the, the Maryland Jockey Club. For now, Valet, our uh, Rodeo gift shop, a uh, Rodeo Drive gift shop and poker remain closed, though we anticipate having a poker offering in August, hopefully before Delaware Park, which is our nearest competitor, so that uh, we can beat them to the punch a little bit. 
Um, gaming revenues have been strong since reopening. So we're up 17% over the same time last year, which is about a million dollars more in revenue. The bulk of this really is pent up demand because we haven't been marketing to the levels in the past to bring in that business. But I'd say despite those early numbers, the reality for the future is, is incredibly uncertain. It's, it's gonna be challenging to maintain that pace and nearly impossible to predict what even a month from now will look like. Um, our attendance is down about 25% versus pre-COVID. So though we have some good play, it shows that people still aren't necessarily coming out with the same regularity or even at all. So that's about 30,000 fewer customers that we would have otherwise expected in that time frame. We're starting to see some of that early unmet demand tail off, which means marketing expenses, you know, one of our largest expenses are beginning to increase, in particular with, with mail. So that being said, um, one of the challenges is some of our typical marketing levers can't really be pulled right now. Not safe to have a large event or promotion um, where, uh, where you'd have a lot of customers gather or entertainment. Um, so we're, we're concerned over the course of time and not, about not being able to use some of those lever, levers that we typically do. Um, so going forward from a safe environment standpoint, the biggest challenge is going to be to continue to be balancing the customer's typical experience versus whatever safety guidelines we get from the CDC or other industry health experts. Um, investments in these areas and enhanced cleaning uh, protocols can be expensive, um, but it's a critical component of how we succeed and, and make uh, employees and customers feel safe. Our position in the state is unique in that we are surrounded by other states with gaming. So from a revenue standpoint, that adds to the, the fact that we're dealing with the COVID revenue related uh, situation. So it's gonna make it difficult to get back to where we were in February, particularly given the tax rates in some of those surrounding states. Um, Pennsylvania and Delaware, for instance, make up 17% of our revenues, about $13 million annually. Um, Penn National in Pennsylvania has delayed construction on two casinos that were the same, really the same size of us that are coming in right in our backyard. We anticipate that will ramp up again in coming months and had already projected a $3 million uh, annual revenue shortfall to going across the border to Pennsylvania once they open. Um, work on the Great Wolf Lodge, which we were thrilled to have come in as our next door neighbor right here has also been delayed with no announcement as to when construction will begin on a project that's already several years out from completion. From a sports betting standpoint, Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania are in effect. So from a revenue standpoint, we look forward to working with this committee and the assembly to, to getting through positive referendum and getting finalization on something similar to last year's Senate bill. Finally, uh, with regards to hiring people, it's been an enormous challenge. Gordon's right, the bulk of people did come back, but um, we still have some furloughed employees. Right now, we're down about 25 out of our typical 275, which may not sound like a lot, but um, it, everyone adds up with regards to how you service right now. So some employees didn't return, others are maybe calling out more often in the past. And these are just kind of day-to-day -day challenges in really getting to the level of service. The type of things like keeping table games open that we wanna have open, those sorts of things. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a challenge for a long time to get to where we want to from an expected level of service. And that's all I had. So I'm, uh, I'm really proud of how uh, we've come in the last few months where we got to this point. And I really appreciate it to, to give you a sense for what life is like these days at Hollywood. And with that, I'll take any questions. Well, we're gonna save some questions until the end to make sure everyone has a chance, but we, I know we'll have some, uh, and one particular for you, uh, maybe you can even deal with on screen. Uh, next, we have Ocean Downs, Bobby Sample. Chairperson Kaiser and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today regarding our operation at Ocean Downs Casino in Berlin, Maryland. Certainly been trying times, um, but I'm extremely proud of the job that our team has done with our reopening and our ongoing operation. Uh, the shutdown had a significant impact on our company at every level, but was most devastating for our team members. After the casinos were closed, we furloughed 340 team members, uh, only maintaining enough staff to maintain the building, secure the building, and plan for our reopening. So we paid each, each team member two weeks of their average pay inclusive of tips, uh, cashed out some of their paid time off to help them financially as they applied for unemployment, kept all of their benefits in place, including medical, dental, and life insurance, and we paid the full cost of those benefits. And while these actions were absolutely the right thing to do for our team members, they were expensive actions, uh, particularly with no revenue to support them. Uh, we could not have sustained those expenses for much longer. After carrying these expenses through July, we have unfortunately had to discontinue benefits for remaining furloughed team members, uh, the payment of those benefits uh, as of August 1st. In April, working with an industrial hygienist, 
we developed our health and safety plan um, that was approved by both the Worcester County Health Department and the lottery. And we've submitted a copy of our plan to the committee in support of my testimony today. Uh, our county health department was very complimentary of our plan as the most thorough and comprehensive plan that they reviewed, which is, uh, I feel, a reflection of how seriously our company is taking health and safety. We also offered them any assistance necessary for contact tracing. Um, since the majority of casino players uh, use a card when they play, we have their contact information. Uh, we have very detailed information as to where they were on the gaming floor, at exactly what time they were there, which team members assisted them, and what other players they were close to during their visit. Um, our facility looks very different uh, from, uh, from pre-COVID, and the experience for our customers is certainly very different. Uh, before guests can enter our facility, they walk through a temperature detector. All of our team members are wearing cloth masks and they undergo daily health screenings before they're allowed in the building. Uh, guests are required to wear masks unless they are actively um, eating or drinking. When feasible, our team members are stationed behind plexiglass. When that's not feasible, they are wearing either uh, protective eyeglasses or face shields in addition to their cloth masks. Uh, we only have 638 of our 802, 892 slot machines in service, but we've maximized our available games by using polycarbonate slot shields uh, in between games to keep guests safe when they're playing next to each other. And we've reduced seats at our 18 table games, um, and not all of our games are open, not all of our tables are open at any given point in time. Um, currently, only our quick service restaurant is open. Our sit down restaurant, Poseidon's Pub, uh, remains closed. Our bar is open only for walk-up service or to play the bar top slot machines, which are surrounded by plexiglass. We have shortened our operating hours. Uh, in the summer, we are typically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, right now we're operating 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. each day to allow additional time to be clean overnight. We also have a large team of security personnel enforcing our mask mandate. And in addition, our surveillance team is able to spot any potential problems. As you can imagine, all of these necessary actions have created some severe financial burdens compared to our normal operating procedures. As of today, we've recalled 80% of our team members uh, back to work, but due to the capacity restrictions, limited games, reduced operating hours, uh, reduced food and beverage operations, we're not in a position to return uh, the balance of them yet. But it is ultimately our goal to be able to return all of our team members uh, when we are uh, fully reopened. In closing, I'd like to briefly do discuss how 2020 started for Ocean Downs. Uh, we started the year off very strong. Um, overall gaming revenue in January was up 11% to the prior year. Um, overall gaming revenue in February was up 4.3% to the prior year. Um, there were more than $5 million in gaming taxes that were generated from that revenue, supporting education, racing, and in our instance, um, the town of Berlin, the town of Ocean City, um, Ocean Pines, and Worcester County. Uh, for the three months that we were closed, assuming our gaming revenue would have been the same as it was in 2019, we would have contributed um, nearly $7 million uh, in gaming taxes during that time frame. As I've communicated to our team members, reopening is important to our team, to our guests, um, and our community. We must follow our health and safety plans all day, every day. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about our property and how we've weathered the storm uh, up till this point. We know we're not out of the woods, um, but we remain committed to keeping our team members and guests safe, uh, keeping our team employed, and um, funding critical community budgets. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have um, after all the other casinos obviously have taken their turn. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Sample. Um, we will next go to a live casino and hotel. Good afternoon, and thank you all for having us uh, to give you a, a briefing this, this afternoon. Uh, I'm Joe Weinberg, and I'm a partner with the Cordish Companies. We're the owners of the Live Casino Hotel in Anne Arundel County. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just spend a couple minutes on the, the macro environment throughout the nation and the hospitality and gaming industry, talk about the impact of COVID on the Live Casino and uh, our reopening experience and where we might all um, go from here. Um, as many of you may know, the uh, leisure and hospitality industry has been the hardest hit industry in the country. Um, about 8 million 
uh, people uh, ended up in uh, unemployment and uh, leisure and ho hospitality industry. Uh, just look at uh, industries like the airline industry, where the daily uh, employments went from 2.6 million a day down to less than 100,000. Hotel occupancies uh, dropped from the uh, 75 to 80 percent down to 15 to 30 percent throughout the country. Um, similar experience uh, here in, in Maryland. So our industries, which are really predicated on generating large gatherings uh, of people, uh, number one industry hit in the in the country. Um, you know, as you know, unemployment has skyrocketed in the country uh, now uh, over 11 percent and over three million people just in the dining and uh, food service industry uh, unemployed uh, today. Uh, and, you know, in the casino industry, uh, we have elements of all of these hospitality, uh, hospitality uses and are impacted uh, accordingly. Um, at Live Casino, um, prior to the uh, COVID crisis, uh, we were seeing um, pretty healthy increases in, in revenues. We ended up 2019 um, with just over $600 million in gross gaming revenue. Uh, that was an increase of uh, over 25 million from the prior year. Uh, and we were on, on par uh, to see um, similar increases uh, for 2020. We're on a trajectory to do uh, a little over $620 million in gross gaming revenues this year. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of um, the current crisis um, and the, the shutdown of the industry, which was not only here in Maryland, but it was across the country. Um, we're projecting our uh, gross gaming revenues at the end of the year to be um, just under $400 million. So about a $200 million uh, hit on gross gaming revenues in 2020. Uh, in terms of our uh, local um, development uh, uh, contributions. We are on par to contribute about $24 million to the local community through the uh, local development council. Uh, we'll probably be closer to $15 million uh, for, for this year based on current projections. Um, we have uh, also, similar to what the lottery has experienced in the other properties since reopening uh, towards the, uh, the end of, of June, um, we've seen a, a pretty healthy um, return um, to, uh, uh, to business, still below last year, um, but we are cautious in projecting anything based on that because, as others have explained, there's been tremendous pent-up demand uh, in the marketplace, and I think we're experiencing uh, the fact that people have not had the, you know, there's really limited uh, opportunities to to get out of the house and to go anywhere for uh, for entertainment these days. Um, right before, uh, as luck would have it, uh, right before uh, the uh, COVID uh, uh, came into the, the states, and uh, in January of this year, we opened our live hall which is a 4,000 seat live music venue. Um, and then we had to, uh, to close it, um, you know, within a, a couple months after, after opening. Um, and I think, uh, again, not only here in Maryland, but we're seeing in our properties across the country, uh, we don't see live entertainment um, recovering uh, at all in the country or here in Maryland until after there is a, a cure or a vaccine for the for the virus. Uh, and just about a year ago, we opened up a $200 million new 310 room uh, hotel. Um, and again, that's been severely uh, affected and uh, for all intents and purposes is uh, closed down during this, uh, uh, this crisis. Um, in terms of um, reopening, um, as uh, Gordon and the other operators had said, we worked very closely with uh, the lottery, with the uh, with the other properties, to make sure that we were bringing best practices from throughout the country um, to the reopening of our facilities. Um, 
we all are, are uniquely capable of operating safe environments because of the security and surveillance that's um, you know that's so important uh, historically and uh, into the operation of our, our of our businesses. Um, and so we spent in excess of seven figures um, in preparing our property for uh, reopening, which includes everything from uh, thermal cameras at the entrances, both for our back of house uh, uh, team member areas, as well as uh, our front of house um, uh, guest uh, entrances, um, uh, cleaning protocols, uh, uh, disinfectants throughout the, throughout the facility, um, social distancing um, uh, protocols as well. Um, um, Mr. Weinberg, you're at about six and a half minutes. So can you wrap this up? Sure. Um, so we're operating at about 15% of, uh, uh, of our gaming um, positions. Um, and um, just in terms of where we go from here, you know, we look forward to working with the committee on ways that we can work together as partners to return the industry to its uh, uh, you know, revenue producing uh, uh, past, make that the future, and look at how we can come up with programs that help us to drive revenue, uh, facilitate additional employment, and be able to continue to operate in this uh, COVID environment. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, next, we have uh, Skylar Dice from Rocky Gap. And good afternoon, Chair Kaiser, Vice Chair Washington, and the committee members. My name is Skylar Dice. I'm the general manager of the Rocky Gap Casino and Resort. Thank you for taking the time to discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on Rocky Gap Casino Resort and the rest of the Maryland operators. Rocky Gap Casino Resort closes doors on March 16, 2020 by orders of Governor Hogan because of the rapid spread of COVID-19. That short closure turned into a 94-day closure of the casino and the majority of the resort. During the week of March 16th, we went from 467 team members at the resort to 27. This decision to lay off 94% of our staff was not taken lightly. However, we wanted to ensure that we could emerge from this pandemic as a viable business. Throughout the closure, we estimated that we lost over $21 million in overall revenue and business volumes are still nowhere near where our original 2020 projections had put them. In addition to the loss in top line revenue, there were still great costs in the upkeep of the property as a whole. Even though the golf course is not able to open until May, the bulk of the expense in maintaining the course came during the months during our closure so that it would be ready when we could reopen. Not only does that have serious long-term ramifications on our business, it also causes some shortfalls at the local level. Allegheny County is one of the poorest counties in the state of Maryland, and we take great pride in being a local partner to the county. The local economic development grant is 100% funded through Rocky Gap Casino slot revenue and helps offset the cost of over 20 critical volunteer fire departments, a local scholarship fund, and a pool of grant money for economic redevelopment in the area. As one of the most distressed counties in the state of Maryland, I can attest how this money has helped the community in years past and what a tremendous impact it has made and what a strain taking such a large hit to that grant money is going to put on Allegheny County moving forward. This will also be a shortfall from the hotel motel tax in Allegheny County as we struggle to match our hotel occupancy rates from previous years. We're fortunate to house 50 to 70 members of the Maryland National Guard during the COVID-19 shutdown to help provide support for their activation on the western side of the state. This allowed us to bring back a handful of key team members in late April and provide a good template for how to operate the property once we were able to reopen. Our leadership team at Rocky Gap Casino took the challenge of making our property safe for our guests and team members very seriously. Our property has always thrived in the mantra of providing experiences, touts cleanliness, friendliness, and timeliness. Um, given that, we've installed over 100 additional hand sanitizing stations, hand wipe stations throughout the property, and the increased presence of cleaning staff in high touch areas through the resort. We also installed some thermal cameras at our front doors to ensure that we're monitoring the temperature of all guests coming to the resort and have separated the entrance and exits to exit to limit the flow in and out of the resort. We've installed plexiglass barriers in between many of our slot machines in the areas we were not able to put the barriers to provide adequate social distancing and the machines were taken out of service. We went from 400 or 665 machines down to 416 during the shutdown. 
we made the decision to close the casino down for four hours each night for deep cleaning, aside from Friday and Saturday night, to provide a thorough deep clean of the casino. We have worked with both the Maryland Lottery and the Allegheny County Health Department on our health and sanitation guidelines for the property. There is also a great deal of collaboration with the other casino operators within the state to ensure that we are all looking to implement the best industry standards for our openings and that cross communication continues to take place with the other casinos to this day. Governor Hogan issued an executive order permitting us to reopen on June 19th at 50% capacity. When we reopened, there was good volumes on the onset of the opening. With some pent up demand, business volumes are still nowhere near where they should be in the month of July, which is historically one of our busiest months. While the hotel remains busy on the weekends, we are nowhere near capacity in the month in which we have historically averaged in the mid 90% range for occupancy. The biggest struggle appears to be the recreational traveler as the majority of our business is coming from our 60 mile radius local currently. And historically over 50% of our database comes from outside the state of Maryland. And with competing casinos allowed to open earlier in West Virginia and Pennsylvania, we find ourselves playing catch up to regain our market share. The drop in hotel revenue will still have a negative effect on Allegheny County as they're very reliant on the hotel motel tax from the resort. Staffing continues to be a challenge for the resort. In a typical year, we would like to have roughly 550 team members at this point in the summer, and we're running the operation only 74% of that number currently, and it is a struggle to provide the level of service that our guests have grown accustomed to at Rocky Gap Casino. We made the difficult decision not to reopen our buffet, kept down our outdoor bars, and have kept the casino at or below the 50% occupancy level required by the governor as well as our restaurant. And we've still not yet reopened the spa because of the difficult, uh, difficulty of providing that service in the time of COVID. Along with the challenges of bringing the business back to life were the challenges of getting people to back to work. There was fear and trepidation upon reopening. Not all of our team members wanted to come back to work. It became very difficult to compete with the additional $600 in federal employment that many of our frontline workers were receiving. There was also genuine concern from some of our team members about coming back to work altogether whether it be for their own health or for protecting their family's health. We granted COVID-19 leave of absences for most of these team members and remain hopeful that if the positivity rate continues to improve in the state, that they will feel ready to come back to work. Well, it was great to be able to reopen and work on getting back to whatever normal looks like now. We have a long way to go to get there. And we will need help in finding our way back to normal. We respectfully ask from the legislature help and getting team members back quicker, keeping our employees and guests safe, and to help drive more revenue for the state of Maryland. I'm grateful for the support of Director Mendenica and his team at the Maryland Lottery for all of their guidance through the pandemic and working to get the casinos open again. I appreciate all of the members of this committee allowing me the time to discuss our troubles through the pandemic, and I thank you for your time. Uh, that, thank you, Mr. Dice. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we're hearing from Horseshoe Casino. Mr. Conroy? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you very much. So I look back in March, the first week of March, uh, Baltimore City Mayor Young and I opened up the Ben's Chili Bowl outlet. The second week of March, uh, celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay was on property for a special demonstration. And the third week of March, we closed. So it's been a long 105-day uh, closure. We were happy to open up on June 26th. And so we've been open about a month or so. Uh, I won't go through all of our details because much of them are similar to, our, to my colleagues, but of our 2,100 slot machines, we have roughly 1,000 machines open. We have 50% of our table games positions open. For example, a six spot blackjack game has three positions open to promote social distancing and again, occupancy restrictions. Uh, as of last week, uh, we have only takeout food service and we have no bars open, uh, again, to eliminate the possibility of large crowds. Uh, face coverings, temperature checks at the door for all guests and all team members. Uh, we did find some golden, uh, an opportunity to purchase uh, most of our disposable masks that we offer complimentary to our team members and our guests from a Baltimore City WMBE firm. Uh, enhanced cleaning and disinfecting procedures throughout the casino. And again, we've had some opportunities to use some diverse vendors for, for sourcing. So we're a month in. Um, I would say, as, as Gordon mentioned, our slot business is better than expected. So despite the fact that we have half the machine count, roughly we're seeing similar numbers to last July. So that's been very encouraging. 
table games has been challenging. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have less positions at each table. And it's something we're going to have to continue to uh, improve upon because that's a very important piece of our business, especially here in Baltimore City. Uh, solid business levels have allowed us to recall about 60% of our team. And most of our team members come from Baltimore City. So it's important to get as many people back as possible. And it's clearly been probably the one of the only good things that have happened to welcome our team members back. We are a family here at the Horseshoe, and it's great to get our family back together. We have seen very positive acceptance from both guests and team members for our new uh, COVID protocols, which has been great. We haven't seen resistance on masks, for example. Uh, we're certainly committed to Baltimore City, and we have a great working relationship with the city, uh, one of which uh, that I've been working on extensively is a collaboration with the Baltimore City Health Department led by Dr. Daraja. Uh, we, we work very well together. I'd say one of the, the big concerns that I have, I'm sure most of the operators have throughout the country, in fact, is the testing delays. And it's something we, we continue to look for, who can get us test results back quickest. We are quick to ask our team members to take tests and they, if, they uh, if they exhibit any signs, could be a fever, it could be, they're not feeling well. We, we strongly encourage them to go get a test that we will facilitate and pay for. However, two-week testing delays are very concerning. So within Caesars Entertainment, our, our, our global uh, parent, you know, our ethical and moral compass is called our code of commitment. And it, we have uh, used that as our moral compass uh, throughout this, this pandemic, relating to our team members, our customers, our communities, and our environment. So as been, has been mentioned, you know, a couple of things I'd love to work with the assembly on, you know, growing gaming revenues by sports and online wagering. And those were discussed earlier. Uh, we are seeing that some of our sister properties in New Jersey and Pennsylvania have kept the, the revenue flow going despite the bricks and mortar shutdown by having those other channels. I think just great continued collaboration with Gordon Medanica and his team, along with the legislature, of getting most of our team members back. Uh, and then really... Uh, uh, providing any kind of gaming tax incentives to drive more casino visits in Maryland. If we could look at uh, perhaps working on some marketing tax credits like uh, neighboring jurisdictions in Pennsylvania, I think that would go a long way to get more people back into the casinos. So with that, I'll have to, happy to answer any questions at the end of the testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Conroy. We will move on to uh, MGM National Harbor. We have Jorge Perez. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, thanks again, Madam Chair and the, uh, and the uh, committee um, for, your, uh, for your time this afternoon. Um, clearly you're seeing a, uh, a pattern and the commonality here between um, uh, all our, indus our, our industry in general and, um, and our challenges, right? Our operational challenges. So I'll highlight a few things. So first of all, I'm Jorge Perez. I am, I, I serve in a dual capacity. I'm the president of National Harbor, but I'm also the portfolio regional president um, for MGM. So I do oversee seven other properties, um, which does provide some unique perspective. Um, give you a little color of uh, what's transpired over the last few months. And then I'll, I'll drill down into uh, National Harbor specifically. Um, you know, we operate 17 domestic resorts, um, and early in the year, the first thing we did is we started seeing trends internationally. We created a task force at the corporate level with our most senior folks, including our CEO. Um, and I've been fortunate that I was a part of that task force. Um, you know, through that, through that process, we were closely monitoring, you know, uh, what was going on across the country, working with our local, state, and federal officials. Um, and, and monitoring the government actions at that time, which began, as many of you recall, just restricting our businesses and eventually uh, shutting down our operations. Um, our first property that we closed domestically was in Ohio back on March 6. And, um, and, and as you've heard from all the operators, you know, just to maintain the financial viability of the company, um, we had to make the difficult decision to furlough 96% uh, of our 60,000 plus domestic employees. Um, in order to mitigate um, our heavy expense burden um, on a monthly basis. Um, as a corporation, um, we did volunteer to provide two weeks pay um, along with PTO. Um, also, we've been paying full health care uh, through the end of August. Uh, one thing we did as well as a company, you know, we have an emergency relief fund uh, that's been in existence for some time, uh, but a lot of the executives, and we also had some pretty high prof uh, profile headliners, um, entertainers uh, fund this. 
um, in the excess of 12, you know, 12, 13 million dollars. So this has gone a long way to help our employees through these tough times. And that fund will stay in existence. And we're highly encouraging our executives to continue to fund um, that program. Um, so as we, as the committee, as we turned into the reopening of the resort, we set a very clear goal for ourselves. And I think you've heard this loud and clear from the industry, uh, the safety and the health of our employees and our customers is paramount and our number one priority. Um, you know, we hired as uh, MGM hired uh, a company, a third party, Golden Corporation, I'm sorry, Golden Corporation, which is an occupational health and safety environmental firm um, to provide uh, direction on how to reopen the most effective uh, way possible uh, under these uh, new conditions. Um, and through these efforts, we did uh, develop a seven point safety plan. Um, we did provide a copy of that for the uh, committee's review. Um, and over the last several months, and certainly as we look uh, to the uh, remainder of the year and into next year, we've invested tens of millions of dollars um, to ensure that we're doing this properly. Uh, with regard to National Harbor, um, uh, you know, obviously we weren't spared here from, a, from an employee perspective. We had a furlough roughly 3,200 of our 3,400 employees, again, about 96% of our workforce. And we were a bit delayed in our reopening, um, just considering the, uh, the conditions in Prince George's County. We worked very closely with uh, the, uh, the, the County Health Department, as well as our local leaders. And we opened our doors to a private event, effective Friday 26, uh, June 26. Um, so we were closed about 102 days. Uh, fortunately, with the reopening, we were able to bring back about 2,200 employees, uh, two thirds of our workforce. Um, and then much, you know, much like you've heard from our peers, you know, when we opened our doors, um, uh, the, our, our space looked very different, right? We were under capacity limitations, um, extensive health and safety protocols. Um, you know, we started doing uh, screening and temperature checks of both employees and customers, mandating masks uh, for our employees and our customers, physical distancing enforcement, plexiglass barriers, and all, all those things. I won't go into all those details. Uh, the other piece that we did uh, do is just verify that our HVAC systems um, were up to par, and they are. We circulate our air every five minutes, so 100% of our air in our casino is circulated. And we also have state-of-the-art HEPA filters just to keep the, uh, the level of the um, air quality where it needs to be. Um, another component as well is we took an opportunity to invest heavily in, um, in technologies, digital innovations, including contactless technologies for hotel check-in, a digital key, so you no longer need to go to the front desk to utilize uh, a key to enter your room. Also, mobile F and B ordering and queuing, and then payment uh, contactless payment processing at our restaurants. From an economic standpoint, um, our property gaming revenues we're about seventy to eighty percent currently, so we are doing better than expected. Um, but I do think we, I, you know, I believe we all agree on this. We are benefiting from the lack of um, uh, entertainment options. Um, uh, in, in our markets. Um, the majority of our table games are open, including poker, um, albeit, you know, reduced positions and uh, roughly 50% of our VLTs are still closed. Um, uh, also to ensure, you know, adequate physical distancing. You know, at this point, and, and I think you've heard it loud and clear, it's just, you know, um, as far as predictability of forecasts, it's just hard to predict that with any certain certainty. Um, you know, we've got about 25%, we're off about 25% in casino admissions. And um, what we're seeing is clearly our inability, especially this larger integrated resort, our inability to spike our business on the weekends. Um, that's an opportunity where we, as we call it, peak the peaks. Um, it's an opportunity to drive uh, large scale entertainment tournaments and those type of things, which um, at no, uh, no point in the near future we'll be able to do. Um, also, we are seeing our, client, our, our elderly clientele. Um, so as we look at our database and segmentation, we are seeing that our elderly clientele, although they are starting to come back, um, that's where we've seen the largest drop off. So if you look at 56 and above, um, those customers um, have been a little bit more hesitant to come back. And then just in closure, you know, as we look at future opportunities, we've talked about online casino and sports betting, um, absolutely a great opportunity for our industry uh, to generate uh, incremental revenues uh, for the state. Um, you, uh, you've also heard a little bit about uh, employees and the rehiring of employees. I can tell you, particularly here at National Harbor, we've got a lot of open positions and it's been a challenge uh, to get employees to come back. Um, some of which have come back, have opted to go ahead and sit on the sidelines. Um, they just don't feel comfortable working in, in the new conditions. And it is more difficult, it is more challenging for them. 
So any methods to incentivize uh, furloughed employees to come back to work um, would be a benefit to all of us. And then last- uh, Mr. Perez, thing, can you, yeah. wrapping up? Yes, the last point. Uh, the last point is um, uh, with regard to innovations as well. So any sort of incentives for our industry just to continue to invest in any sort of uh, uh, innovative technologies to improve health and safety. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, I see just one question. I want to first, uh, on behalf of members of the committee, thank all of you for uh, showing up today and, and presenting. I want to uh, uh, let uh, Delegate Mosby ask that first question, and but but again, just say thank you to everyone. Delegate Mosby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two small, two really small questions. Uh, the first question is: I'm not sure if this was uh, communicated, but prior to returning to work about a month ago, did every employee have to test negative for COVID to actually return? Or uh, what was the strategy there? If just one casino could answer. Yeah, it's Randy Conroy from the Horseshoe uh, Delegate. Uh, yeah, we had a health screen questionnaire at the Horseshoe where uh, team members before they were even allowed on property did a online questionnaire that had five questions and in any one of those triggered uh, the need for a COVID test. We actually had uh, a nurse in our garage uh, scheduled and they, they would come in and stay in their car and get a test done beforehand. So that's okay. something that actually every day when someone comes through the door, not only do they get temperature scanned, they have to pass the health questionnaire. And again, any, any of those yeses trigger an instant COVID test. And that wasn't yeah. a regulation from the state, or was that just something specific to Horseshoe? I think that was specific to Horseshoe, but I think all of the all of my colleagues have something similar in mind to, to spring folk coming in. Okay. Does, did um, anyone do anything dramatically different? Any, I'll, I'll just add for National Harbor. So um, it was not mandatory. Um, what we did is try to make it as convenient as we could for our employees. So we did have just adjacent to our property, um, Addison School. Um, is a facility that um, we still own. And um, um, so we provided free uh, tests and again, super easy access for the employees, but it was not mandated. I mean, encourage not mandated. And one last question, Madam Speaker. I, I guess for, for all the casinos- uh, Thanks for the promotion, but, uh, but uh, I'll stick with ways and means. What's your last question? No, I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry, Madam Chair. I, I guess, um, uh, just for all the casinos, has anyone, um, any employees tested positive in the past month? If so, how many? Uh, at Ocean Downs, we've, we've not had any positive tests of any employee that's been on property. Yeah, and Delegate at, at Randy Conrad at the Horseshoe, we had one person test positive before we opened roughly three weeks before we opened part of our essential team. Uh, we, we're tracking down a couple other possibilities right now, but it's so far the incidence has been uh, extremely low. Anyone else? Hollywood has had a couple of cases. We've had one, but not, not casino related. And Mr. Perez looked like you tried jumping in. Yes, yes, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, MGM National Harbor has had several. We have. And we, and Weinberg, just, we, we've had a couple. Okay, uh, thank you all. Um, any other questions from members? We'll give everyone a little bit of time to figure out that reaction button. Anybody? Or anything from Mr. Medenica? All right, it looks like uh, that's all we've got. So uh, again, wanna thank uh, all, all, uh, all the members who joined and then all of you representing the casinos and uh, Mr. Medanica and his team from the lottery. Thank you all very much. And to everyone watching, thank you for watching and uh, listening in. Take care. Great. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.